This morning's reading is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 to 14. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but has now been revealed through the appearance of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Stuart, and I'm one of the associate vicars here. And this morning, we're going to be continuing uh, in our series going through the book of 2 Timothy, as we've just had read for us. And our sermon series at the moment is called How to Make Your Life Count. Each and every one of us has been made by God and called by God to live a life that makes an eternal difference. And we are looking through this letter for nuggets of advice. Um, in this letter, the older Apostle Paul is writing to the young leader, Timothy, and he is looking back on a long and fruitful ministry, and he's passing on some hard-won life advice as to how to, to make it to the end, and how to live a life that's fruitful uh, and makes a difference. And this morning we come to our second, our second in the series. And um, the message that Paul has for us this morning is, is very simple, but it's very challenging. And it's this. Don't drift. Don't drift. Uh, growing up uh, in South Africa, um, we were very privileged that my aunt and uncle had a wonderful holiday home uh, in paradise. It's a tiny little town called Sinkwazi up on the northeast coast of South Africa and it really was paradise and occasionally we used to go as a family and join them for, for uh, a summer holiday. And in particular in this little uh, town um, the beach was incredible. It had absolutely everything you could want in a beach. It had real-life genuine palm trees, it had a lagoon, it had amazing white sand and it had enormous waves to go swimming in. We really used to go, uh, enjoy going um, for, for a holiday there. This beach was perfect um, except for one thing. There was only one flaw uh, with this amazing beach in my humble opinion. Uh, well actually there were also sharks, that was another problem but that's pretty standard in South Africa. But the, apart from the sharks there was the one thing that was wrong with this beach was the, the rip current. It was a sideways current that used to carry you across across the beach when you were swimming. I don't know whether you've ever experienced this when you've been to the beach. On a good day, uh, no, or uh, well, on a bad day, um, this meant that you could spend your entire time swimming. Uh, you had to just swimming completely sideways. You just had to swim across the beach just to stay in one place. But actually, much more dangerous uh, were, were the good days. Uh, and I remember many, many um, times I would be playing ball with my brother um, or I'd be swimming with my cousin and then uh, suddenly you'd hear the sharp, shrill sound of the lifeguard's whistle and you'd look up and you'd realise that without, without, without knowing uh, you had just drifted. Uh, you, had, you had drifted 40, 50 metres and suddenly you were well outside of the safe zone and you didn't even realise it. You had drifted. And Paul's uh, message this morning is about drifting. It's simple but it's challenging. 
Paul's message this morning is if you want to live a life that counts, you need to stay centred. You need to stay centred. The good news is that this isn't rocket science. Um, uh, it's not, you know, some new and fancy thing that only a few uh, can do. Um, it doesn't take uh, a genius. Um, the challenging thing um, is that it takes a lot more intentionality uh, in our lives to not drift than we think. And if we just uh, don't pay attention, if we just go with the current, we will find uh, that before we even realise it, um, we, we've drifted in our faith way further than um, we should have. And we're no longer living fruitful, productive lives. So this morning, we're going to look at this passage. We're going to look at two things that Paul highlights about how um, to stay centred and how um, to live a life that makes a difference. Let me pray for us, though, before we dive in. Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and the wisdom um, that he had. Lord, thank you for the fruitful life that he lived. And as we look at this advice to Timothy, Lord, would you speak to us too? Would you speak to us about um, things that we need to take note of in our lives, that you would um, help us to live lives uh, that count? Amen. Amen. So, the first thing uh, that Paul says to Timothy and would say to us, if you want to live a life that counts, first thing is keep Jesus central. Keep Jesus at the centre of your life and of your ministry. Paul begins here by saying to Timothy, essentially, don't become embarrassed of Jesus. Verse 8, he says, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And you know what? I love, I love that Paul feels he needs to say this. Don't become embarrassed of Jesus. Because it tells me, it tells me that he knew that this was going to be hard. That actually it is a temptation for Christians uh, to become embarrassed of Jesus. Even for the great Timothy, his protege, uh, you know, so promising, so talented a leader, he knew that it would be a temptation to become embarrassed of Jesus. Each of us, uh, I think, has this temptation. Of course, when we start out as Christians, uh, we're all excited about Jesus. Um, he, you know, he, he, is, he is everything we can think about and talk about. But somewhere along the line, uh, we can drift. And all kinds of other things grow up in our Christian lives. We get interested in church and theology and all kinds of other things until eventually, without realising it, we've drifted. We've sidelined the Saviour. And he's no longer at the centre. And this can happen for all kinds of reasons. For Timothy, in this letter, it appears that his temptation is because of persecution. Um, he was uh, under a lot of pressure to drop Jesus from his gospel. Um, it wasn't very palatable for the Jews. It wasn't a great way to reach the Romans. And he was watching his mentor, Paul, uh, be persecuted and in prison. Um, because of Jesus. And so he was under a lot of pressure to drop Jesus from his, his message and from his ministry. For us, I think there can be lots of other reasons why this happens. And I want just to pick up uh, three, briefly, three reasons that I think, three ways in which we can accidentally drift from keeping Jesus central in our lives. And I hope uh, that as I just talk through a few of these, we might recognise in ourselves one of these temptations. The first one um, is we are tempted to get bored of Jesus. I know this, uh, this is a temptation for me. When we first uh, meet Jesus, as I said, um, he's the most mind-blowing person we've ever met. You know, uh, we could feel like we could read and reread the story of his life, uh, his parables, his death. We, there's just so much there. The most profound person we've ever met. But familiarity has a way of breeding contempt, doesn't it? And I think one of the great temptations for Christians as we get older, as we get more mature, is to just get bored. And to, you know, to, to just want something new, 
something exciting, something, uh, you know, critical, if you like. It might start out as a really good journey to deepen our faith and ask the tough questions. But I have seen many, many Christians and many leaders basically sidelined because, um, because they've begun to confuse complexity for profundity. Begun to think that you have to be cynical and critical. You have to be super intelligent and super complicated to be to, to, to get to the authentic faith, um, authentic part of our faith. Somewhere along the line, we get bored of, of, of just reading the Gospels, of, of, of just contemplating the cross on the resurrection. Somewhere along the line, we begin to scorn the idea of listening to simple sermons and sharing a simple Gospel. We get bored, and so we're tempted to sideline the Saviour. Another temptation is the temptation to get activist. I certainly know this temptation. Often it is our love for Jesus and our desire to serve him that, that leads us initially to, to get involved in serving the last, the least and the lost. He gives us his heart to serve. But I've observed over the years that many people uh, go, go drift um, off track um, because somewhere along the line, um, the cause that they're serving replaces Jesus. Somewhere along the line, um, uh, the, we can invest more of our identity, uh, more of our energy in, in, in the project, in the thing that we're doing, than, than in the person we were originally serving. And I've actually seen that it can be a really big temptation um, to, to drop Jesus. As you're going along, uh, you, you one day re realise that, hold on, you know, um, maybe Jesus isn't the best way to further this cause. Uh, he isn't popular enough. He's not the best way uh, to, to, to work with others. He, he's not popular with Christians. He doesn't raise money well. And somewhere along the line, we can be tempted to sideline the Saviour for the sake of the cause, whatever it is. And then a third way, and I think it's just much more simple, is that we just get tired. We get tired of uh, the odd looks we get from our colleagues when we try and talk about Jesus. We get tired of the eye rolling from our family when we try to explain to them that Jesus died for them. We get tired of people thinking that we are simpletons uh, for believing in a man who lived 2,000 years ago and who died and rose again. So we just find it easier to sideline the Saviour, to find other easier things to put at the centre of what we talk about, of church, whether it be faith, or prayer, or community, or justice, or anything else than Jesus. There are so many reasons why we can find ourselves unconsciously, slowly drifting until we've sidelined the Saviour. But Paul would say to us, if you want to live a life that counts, and if you want to have a church that makes a difference, Remember to keep Jesus central. Paul, who after all we have to remember was, was a genius, cleverer than any of us, and I can say that even in Cambridge. Paul, who was the, the, the arch activist, you know, who planted more churches and did more stuff than we ever will. Paul, the martyr, who died for his faith, suffered more than we ever will. He would say to us, Keep Jesus central. There's nothing more profound than Jesus. You never graduate from the gospel. There's nothing more powerful, impactful in this world than Jesus. Our friends, our family, our society need Jesus. He is the power to change lives. There's nothing more valuable than Jesus. He is worth the discomfort um, because he, 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 he brings life. And that's what our friends and our families need. The first thing that Paul would say to us is, if you want to live a life that counts, guard what you've already got. Keep hold of the gospel. Make sure Jesus is at the centre. And the second thing uh, that Paul would say to us is this, guard your gratefulness for grace. Guard your gratefulness 
for the graciousness of God. Cultivate that wow factor in your life at the generosity of God. I want to begin this uh, point by uh, just showing us a short clip from the old film Charlie and the Chocolate Factory uh, when Charlie finds his winning gold ticket. So we're going to watch that now. I think I'll buy just one more for my Grandpa Joe. Sure. Why not try a regular Wonka bar this time? Fine. Give me a newspaper. All right, all right. Who's the one that did it? Take it easy. One at a time. Did you hear the news? That gambler all from right. Paraguay made up a phony ticket. Right. That means there's one golden ticket still floating That's around somewhere. One. Can you imagine the nerve of that guy trying to fool the whole world? Oh, he really was a crook. Well, this means the contest goes on forever. Wonder why they the next one. Take it easy. Take it easy. One at a time. <laughs> I wonder, do you remember <laughs> that feeling in your faith? That, wow, I have won the golden ticket. That, that moment when it began to dawn on you all that God had done for you. Uh, you know, wow, Lord, you, you lived for me. You came to earth. You died for me. You've forgiven me. You've adopted me into your family. You've given me just wow, 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 wow. Gratefulness should be at the centre of our lives as Christians. That wow should just be what sustains us. And yet so often it isn't. So often it, it, it sort of, I don't know, it ekes away. We live in a world, um, maybe it's because we live in a world full of rights. People always demanding what they deserve. I deserve this, I deserve that. Maybe uh, it is because we have a small view of God. We think that uh, oh yeah, he's a God of love, of course he had to love me, of course he had to forgive me. Or maybe it's just, as I've said before, that familiarity begins to breed contempt. And somewhere along the line, it's really easy to drift and lose the wonder at the graciousness of our God. But Paul says to Timothy, guard what you've got. Guard the, your gratefulness for God's grace. And he picks out, I want us to see, he specifically draws Timothy's attention to three things. He reminds him of God's grace. He says, Timothy, remember that God called you and saved you, number one, not because of anything you've done. You know, after we've been a Christian for a while, it's easy to think that we are bringing something to the table. It's easy to think that, you know, kind of, it's in, it's in God's be uh, interest to have us on the team. But Paul reminds Timothy, no, this is not because of anything you've done. This was totally undeserved. Remember that. Number two, he reminds Timothy, God uh, planned this before time began. God planned this before time began. Timothy, remember, this wasn't your idea. This wasn't your plan. Before you'd ever had a thought about God, he'd thought about you. This is all his initiative. And then finally, he reminds Timothy, remember how big this gift is that you've received. Remember just the magnitude of what it is God has done for you. He picks out particularly here the eternal life, the immort immortality, uh, life with God that we've been promised. But he could have picked out anything else as well. Forgiveness, God's spirit, all of those things I mentioned. Sometimes we have to remember just how big just how extraordinary, just how mind-blowing it is, the things that our God has given us. When did we get bored of this? When did we start thinking that all of this that God has given us was our right? 
when did we start thinking that somehow we were the ones doing God the favour here? There's absolutely nothing compelling him to give us all this. It is all out of his goodness and his grace. And the Christian life should be full of gratefulness. And I have observed over the years that Christians that live lives that count, Christians that go the distance and make it to the end of their lives, continuing to be fruitful, are Christians who guard their gratefulness at grace. First of all, they choose never uh, to graduate from the gospel to keep Jesus central. But number two, they do something more. They never graduate from grace. They continue to cultivate that wow factor, that gratefulness in their lives. They spend time in God's presence remembering what he's done. They spend time in God's presence thanking him. They spend time in God's presence remembering that they don't deserve any of this. And it keeps them fueled by grace. Christians who are fueled by grace live gracious lives. When we stay aware and amazed at the goodness of God, it keeps us gentle. It keeps us humble. It makes us quick to forgive and quick to give. Lives lived out of grace and gratefulness are lives that make a difference. Paul says to, to Timothy, don't graduate from the gospel and don't graduate from grace. Guard your gratefulness for God's grace. Friends, it is an amazing truth that God has called us to live lives that make an eternal difference. But he says to us, the first step to living that life is, is, is to guard what we've already got. It's good news. We don't have to go off somewhere else, find new and exciting things, work out. It's not for the elite. All of us can do this, but we have to guard what we've already got. And at the heart of that, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of John, um, abide in me and I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. Remain in me and I will remain in you and you'll bear much fruit. Without me, apart from me, you can do nothing. Keep Jesus central. Let's be encouraged. This isn't rocket science. And I'm really grateful when I look, uh, look out over the ages and I look at, at great uh, leaders and preachers and uh, evangelists and, and see that actually keeping Jesus at the centre, the saviour at the centre, is the fuel for their effectiveness. I look at Ravi Zachariah and John Lennox, great ap apologetics and evangelists, um, who've always kept Jesus in the middle, been quick to share the simple good news of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. They can move from talking philosophy straight to the simple saviour. I've been really grateful for church leaders, whether it be the great Charles Simeon, whether it be Andy and Mike at Soul Survivor, whether it be um, Tim Keller, people who, who, who lead big churches and have big ministries, but who have kept the saviour at the centre, kept grace at the centre. And it, it has made them effective. They continue to bear fruit. Um, they haven't moved on, they haven't got bored. And I can think of so many examples. And it's true for us too, when we look around us at Christians who are still bearing fruit, it's because they've not graduated from gospel and they've not graduated from grace. So let's be encouraged. This is an encouragement for us this morning. Let's choose not to get bored of Jesus. Let's choose not to accidentally drift and sideline the Saviour. Let's choose to cultivate our relationship with him. Let's choose to cultivate our wow and our gratefulness for the grace he's poured out in our lives. Let's choose to abide in him and trust as he promised that as we do, he will make us, uh, he will make our lives count. He, he will be the one who, who helps us make an eternal difference. Let's guard what we've got and see the difference that it will make. Amen. Let me pray for us as we finish. 
Lord, we thank you that the power uh, in our lives is you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we want to pray that you would help us to keep you at the centre. And Lord, if there are any of us this morning who've sort of realised that we've drifted, that our vital connection with you is waning, that we've filled our lives with so many other things, have filled our faith with so many other things than you, we pray that you would call us back to you. By your spirit, you'd help us to guard the deposit you put in us. And would you help us as a church to keep you at the centre of everything that we do? Thank you that as we do, you will change lives. Pour your spirit into us, we pray. Amen. Amen.